And now I'd like to introduce to you our guest commentator for today, the world-famous designer, Miss Edith Head. The most famous designer in motion picture history was the legendary Edith Head. For over four decades of her 60-year career, Edith brought magic to the silver screen in her unforgettable costumes for Paramount Pictures. Edith decided that Paramount would be a good place for her to get a job because she saw women working there, but she couldn't draw at all. Howard Greer was the costume designer at Paramount, and he taught her how to draw like he drew. But very quickly, she started being very, very useful all around the wardrobe department. And in 1925, another designer named Travis Banton came out from New York. Eventually, Howard Greer decided to leave because all of the big stars were asking for Banton. And Banton was enormously talented. However, without Greer there, he started handing some of the lesser assignments to Edith to do. Banton didn't get along too well with Clara Bow. Clara Bow was Paramount's biggest star. And the public adored her, but she had very poor taste in clothes. She liked to wear bangle bracelets with all, all of her costumes. She wanted to put belts on dresses that weren't supposed to have them. She even wanted to wear high-heeled shoes with ankle socks. And so Banton turned Clara Bow over to Edith to dress. And the most famous picture they did together was Wings, in which Clara Bow wore a uniform through most of the film. In the middle 30s, when Travis Banton was still on hand to do the really big stars, Edith was assigned the starlets and the actresses who were coming up. And the head office told her that these young ladies were to have absolutely nothing to say about the costumes they wore. But nonetheless, Edith managed to talk to them. She managed to get a sense of what they thought looked good on them, what they liked. And she would put those same kind of ideas into the drawings, you know, so that the studio would think they were hers from start to finish. And when these ladies became big stars, they remembered her. And of course, they were very loyal and always wanted her for all their pictures. Edith Head knew how to talk with the stars. She knew how to make them feel very important, how to um, um, give her attention only to them. They always felt it, that they were number one with her. Edith was very, very bright about publicity. She was very bright about promoting herself. But she was smart about, about what worked in a film and what didn't. She really knew. You can, you can spot an Edith film Edith uh, head film a mile away. I mean, there is a style there that's definitely hers. Edith was a very good people person. She worked very well with anybody. Generally on a picture, you have a lot of people who have conflicting ideas. You have the star who wants to look good no matter what. You have the director who wants the clothes to work for the dramatic situation and not be too attention grabbing. You've got the producer who doesn't want to spend too much money the art director, the cameraman, all these people have their input. And Edith was very good about learning about all aspects of filmmaking so that she could discuss these things with everybody. She knew what was safe, and she sometimes would play it safe rather than get herself into a, a, you know, a bad position. Sometimes you do, you know, taking chances is great, but it doesn't work for every director. You have to let, the director has to ask for something special, and she would give it to them, but if she didn't, she played it pretty safe. She wasn't shy, she was powerful, she was strong. She was uh, demanding, she was tough. In 1948, at the insistence of Edith and other Hollywood designers, an Academy Award for Best Costume Design was finally established. Two Oscars would be given, one for black and white and one for color. And Edith was nominated for the picture, The Emperor Waltz, but she didn't win and she was very disappointed. But the next year, she was nominated again for Best Black and White for the movie The Heiress, and she did win. The Oscar for The Heiress would be the first of eight Academy Awards Edith Head would win in her 60-year career. Oh, darling, let's never leave this place. Let's just stay here alone. Don't let Father upset you. I'm the one who counts. 
1949 was when Edith began work on A Place in the Sun. It was directed by George Stevens, and Elizabeth Taylor was borrowed from MGM to play the leading role, so that was the beginning of her long friendship with Elizabeth Taylor. And, of course, Stevens wanted her to look immaculate as a very high society, kind of spoiled, rich girl. The Place in the Sun tulle evening gown was copied many, many times by 7th Avenue designers and department stores all across the country. I'm just fooling around. Maybe you'd like to play. Oh, no. I'll just watch you. Go ahead. Edith later worked with Elizabeth Taylor on a picture called Elephant Walk and throughout the years did a number of projects with her. She always tried to emphasize Taylor's beautiful shoulders, her bust, and her small waist. Edith's favorite director, and the one she worked with many times, was Alfred Hitchcock. Edith worked with Hitchcock and Grace Kelly in To Catch a Thief, which became her all-time favorite film. The first time Cary Grant sees Grace Kelly in the movie, she's wearing a very startling black and white outfit. And the, the colors progress slowly. Uh, at one point, they go for a picnic, and she's wearing kind of a coral pink skirt. And Grace Kelly said to Edith that she didn't want to wear pants for that scene. She wanted to be very feminine, so Edith made her a sporty outfit with a skirt and a blouse. And the, there were two beautiful evening gowns. One was draped white chiffon, the other was draped blue chiffon. These sort of played up the, the cool aspect of Kelly's demeanor. But the very end of the film, she's wearing a fabulous gold lame evening gown. And so, of course, you know this has to be the climax of the picture because nothing can top that dress. So this is where you live. Oh, Mother will love it up here. Roman Holiday presented a challenge to Edith for a number of reasons. The studio had not been able to cast the leading role of the princess. And so finally she was told that Audrey Hepburn was going to play the part. And she was given Audrey Hepburn's measurements, and she was shown the test films that Paramount made of Hepburn. And based upon those things, she made up a number of different versions of each change. She gave her various scarves to put around her neck so that she would cover up her prominent collarbone. She was doing this to sort of hide what she perceived as Audrey Hepburn's faults which Edith was very good at camouflage. Can I have a silk nightgown with rose buds on it? I'm afraid you'll have to rough it tonight. And these. Good job. Sorry, honey, but I haven't worn a nightgown in years. One of the hundreds of films featuring Edith's designs was the perennial holiday classic, White Christmas. The film star, Rosemary Clooney, recalls the black velvet gown that Edith created for her. Everybody talks about the great dress and the diamond pin on my butt. <laughs> there was a, a pin that, that Edith had said, we've got to have something that just kind of breaks up that black velvet. And so that was what she did. She had a rare sense of humor. Edith didn't like to dress women. She loved dressing men. Loved Danny Kaye's, for instance, the uh, the best things happen while you dance. That scene where he was dressed in gray. He had a gray blue suit on, but the socks were exactly the same color and the shoes were exactly the same color. So the extension, the dancing, the, the, it was never broken because of, because of a change of color. It was just, uh, they, they worked together beautifully. Edith found it to be a formidable task in designing the clothes for Gloria Swanson in Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard. Sunset Boulevard represented an interesting challenge for Edith Head. She and Billy Wilder and Gloria Swanson got together and came up with a particular concept for the clothes. They did not want to have Swanson wearing 1920s styles. She was living in a 1920s type house that had never been remodeled since Norma Desmond's glory days. But the, the basic lines of the clothes were the new look that Dior introduced in 1947. And how they brought Norma Desmond into this was just to exaggerate more. And one of the problems in doing this was that the new look accentuated waistlines a lot. And the ideal at that time was to have a very tight waist and a very full skirt. And Gloria Swanson, although she was still quite thin, her waist was not as trim as it had once been. And she did not choose to wear a waist cincher. There just aren't any faces like that anymore. Maybe one, Garbo. 
those idiot producers, those imbeciles. Haven't they got any eyes? Have they forgotten what a star looks like? I'll show them. I'll be up there again, so help me. Edith's dress around the studio was always very conservative, as opposed to some of the other lady designers who would arrive wearing fabulously glamorous clothes. Edith was, was brilliant about uh, uh, packaging herself and realized early on that she was not a glamour girl, and so she, she sort of had that well-dressed schoolmarm look, and it, no matter when you see pictures of Edith, she's maintained it. You always know exactly who the, who the picture is. She generally wore black and white or beige and brown. Once in a great while, she might wear red. She always wore white gloves when she was at Paramount. And she generally wore dark glasses. Now, this was not unusual in the 30s and the 40s when most of the movies were in black and white. Designers, cameramen, art directors, people like that would look at a set through a blue glass to see how it would photograph in black and white. But Edith had another reason for doing it. She wanted to be inscrutable. If she wore her really dark blue glasses in a meeting, nobody could see her eyes and therefore they couldn't tell what she was thinking. Not only was she a talented designer, Edith also knew the value of becoming a household name with the movie going public and appeared often on radio and television. After she got used to appearing on the radio, thanks to Art Linkletter, Edith started appearing on a lot of other shows, even shows like Burns and Allen, and she played the part of Edith Head. She worked very hard at having the public know who she was, and they still know. It had something to do with the person she really was, but to some extent it was an invention as well. So, of course, when she got to be so famous, the more publicity she got, the more times the press wanted to talk to her. And this was great from Paramount's point of view because it was a wonderful way of publicizing the films. She was probably one of the best uh, public relations lady in the business. She knew how to talk her way, and she knew how to talk to the actresses, how to talk to the producer, how to talk to the director, and sometimes even if she didn't know exactly what she was doing, she presented herself like she was on top of the whole thing. So she was really good. Edith was very smart about budgets. If she knew the producer was trying to save money, she'd find ways of reusing costumes from an earlier film, or perhaps using the same pattern to make two different dresses, and just changing the collar and the cuffs. I don't think she was the greatest designer in Hollywood, but she certainly was one of the smartest. We remember Edith Head today, 20 years after her passing, for a number of reasons. Perhaps the most obvious is that she was famous for being famous. But that should not obscure the fact that she was very talented, that she made a real contribution to these pictures that she worked on, that important directors and stars who could have had anybody nonetheless asked for Edith, and that the clothes, like some of the films, are really timeless. They will last forever, as long as film lasts in this world.